I'd like to stay longer than men's allotted days And watch the fleeting changes of life's uneven ways But if my Savior calls me to that sweet home on high I'll live with Him forever in glory by and by Oh yes, I'll live in glory, live in glory by and by I'll tell and sing love story, tell love story there on high There with my dear Redeemer, there no more to die Oh yes, I'll live in glory, glory by, by and by Where the grapes of wrath are stored He hath loosed the faithful lightning Of his terrible swift sword His truth is marching on Just over in the glory land I'll join, yes, join the happy angel band Just over in the glory land Just over in the glory land there with, yes, with the mighty host I'll stand Just over in the glory land Oh yes, I'll live in glory, living by, by, and by I'll tell and sing love story, tell love story there on high There with my dear Redeemer, there no more to die Oh yes, I'll live in glory, glory, by, and Peter and John were in custody and their crime, teaching the people and preaching in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And what further complicated matters for the Jewish authorities in Jerusalem was the undeniable healing of a lame man whom everyone that frequented the beautiful gate of the temple knew quite well. This healing could not be passed off as fake. The man was over 40 years old, and he had been lame since his birth. Yet the people had seen this notable cripple along with Peter and John, and he was not being carried as he usually was by friends, nor was he just hobbling along by sheer determination and willpower. To his delight and to the amazement of all the people, he was leaping and praising God. And of course, not everyone was delighted. Annas, Caiaphas, and the other Jewish authorities were at first disturbed and then puzzled. They arrested Peter and John and set their hearing for the next day. But they had no reasonable charge to bring against them. They first tried to cast some doubt on the source of the power which had been called upon to perform this miracle, but the evidence and the testimony simply didn't point to Beelzebub. And eventually they let Peter and John go free after warning them to quit preaching such nonsense about Jesus and the resurrection of the dead. But you may ask, why would we bring up this incident that is recorded in Acts 4 in connection with a study of the book of Hebrews? The answer is found in Peter's answer to the Jewish leaders. He affirmed that his miracle or this miracle had been performed in the power of Jesus of Nazareth. He referred to Psalm 118 regarding the stone which had been rejected by the builders but which had become the chief cornerstone. And in his conclusion, he stated, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Acts 4, verse 12. In this answer, 
There is an indictment against the entire Levitical system along with its pompous and corrupt rulers. In saying that only Jesus can save, Peter denied the efficacy of animal sacrifice. He denied Jewish tradition, and he denied the authoritative bullying by the Judaism leaders and their appointed rulers. The teaching in Acts 4 is in perfect harmony with what we read in the theme of Hebrews. The shadow was fading as the true substance came to stand in its place. The blueprint, which had found expression in the patterns and forms of Judaism, was now coming to fulfillment in Jesus Christ. There is a statement made in Hebrews 10, verse 26, which especially correlates to Acts 4 and verse 12, although it may be hard to see the connection due to the general way in which many interpret Acts 10, 26. The passage in Hebrews reads, For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Now, this passage has disturbed many Christians because they have ignored the context in which the statement is made. They have interpreted it to mean that if one commits a willful sin, he cannot receive forgiveness for it. However, this passage does not teach the doctrine of some isolated willful sin as being unpardonable. Nonetheless, multitudes of Christians have been deceived into thinking that any conscious sin committed after any entering the church disqualifies them for the promise of heaven. A closer examination of this position proves that it springs from a faulty interpretation. Whether we commit a sin consciously or unconsciously does not determine its chances of forgiveness. God can and does forgive both conscious and unconscious sins. In his letter to Timothy, the Apostle Paul alludes to the fact that though he was unconscious of his sin in persecuting the church of Christ, he wrote, Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Paul was sincere in his persecution of the church, but he was sincerely wrong. Yet the Lord forgave Paul, and according to 1 Timothy, Paul became an example to those who would later believe on Christ for everlasting life. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 16. It seems only right that the Lord would forgive me for sins committed unconsciously, doesn't it? But what about sins I commit with full knowledge? Let's go to the Old Testament and look at King David because he illustrates for us a conscious sin in his affair with Bathsheba. Even though he had several wives, David knew that adultery was wrong. He knew that he should not go in to a woman who was married to another and was not his own wife. He also was aware of the sinfulness of murder. However, in the case with Bathsheba, David committed both of these sins. He lay with Bathsheba, Uriah, Uriah the Hittite's wife, and then to cover this sin, he gave orders to have Uriah killed. David could not claim ignorance of the law, nor could he claim that he had been forced to do these things against his will. In fact, he tried to avoid murder as a cover-up for his sin with Bathsheba. But his scheme to send Uriah home to his wife failed. And that's when David gave Uriah his own death warrant to deliver to Joab. The prophet Nathan was sent to reprove David. And while David did suffer some of the consequences of his sin, as we all do, yet the Lord forgave David. 
Nathan's confrontation with David is recorded in 2 Samuel 12 and verse 13. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. So the Lord forgave David not only for one, but for two willful and conscious sins. To interpret Hebrews 10, 26 to mean that the Lord will not forgive conscious willful sins is to make the scriptures contradict themselves. And any time our interpretation of scripture leads to an obvious contradiction, it should immediately indicate to us that we have misinterpreted a passage. And so it is our understanding that it is faulty and we are the ones who are at fault and not the scriptures. We have found in the scriptures that God does forgive sins even though they are committed with full knowledge of their sinfulness coupled with wholehearted and willful intention. Therefore, our interpretation of Hebrews 10 verse 26 to mean that such sins are unforgivable must be incorrect. But what other interpretation of the passage is possible? As is the case with any sound interpretation of Scripture, we should begin by considering the context. Throughout the book of Hebrews, the shadow of the Mosaical law has been contrasted with the substance of the perfect law of liberty in Jesus Christ. The old covenant had given way to the new covenant. As was stated in Hebrews 8 and verse 13, in that he says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now, what is obsolete or becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. The old law was nailed to the cross of Christ as its types were fulfilled in Jesus. Yet, there were those who were attempting to go back under the law of Moses. Others tried to bring the old law into the church of Christ and bind its ordinances upon Christians. But both of these attempts were contrary to the truth in Christ. This truth in Christ Jesus is the knowledge under consideration here in Hebrews 10 and verse 26. It was the knowledge of fulfillment and forgiveness in Christ which constituted the truth. Peter stated in Jerusalem when he confronted the Jewish leaders, there is no other name under heaven given among men which, by which we must be saved. If we refuse the sacrifice of Christ, to what shall we go for forgiveness? Shall we go to the blood of bulls and goats? The blood of animal sacrifice was only the mere shadow of the true substance, the blood of Jesus. These animal sacrifices only pointed to the true substitute, Jesus Christ our Lord. Well then, shall we trust in our own goodness? It was this very law of Moses which was proof positive that man was a sinner in need of a savior. All the law could ever do was condemn man for his weakness. The law was an excellent critic and a successful teacher but the law was no savior. Shall we then appeal to human wisdom and man-made saviors? In all his wisdom, man cannot produce a system which can salvage his corrupted nature. To those religious leaders of his day who diligently sought to convert an unbelieving world to their traditions and human wisdom, Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. The philosophies and traditions of men will simply not save us. In fact, human wisdom and tradition 
has been more successful at producing doubt and confusion in the world than in producing a Savior. The truth that is revealed in Hebrews is bound up in God's eternal purpose and plan. In Hebrews 10, verses 5 through 10, the writer refers to a passage found in Psalm 40. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. And then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Who was it that had come? Who is speaking here in this psalm? The book of Hebrews attributes this statement to Jesus Christ. It is another passage which illustrates the truth that the animal sacrifices were only temporary. They were only mere shadows of the heavenly realities. The ineffectiveness of animal sacrifice is pointed out in Hebrews 10. The argument is that if the blood of bulls and goats could have taken away sin, then their offering would have ceased. They would have had to continually be offered day after day and year after year, or they would not have had to been offered continually. They did not serve to wipe sin from our memory, but rather they caused sin to be remembered every year. However, the sacrifice of Christ is not like the shadows in this respect because his blood brings full forgiveness. Our sins and iniquities are remembered no more. Christ does not offer himself year after year after year, but having made one sacrifice for all, he perfects those who come to him for cleansing. And this is the teaching of Hebrews 10. The willful sin under consideration in Hebrews 10, 26 is the attempt to abandon Christ and to cleave to the law of Moses. This is the context where the statement is made. It is the sin of rejecting the substance and seeking the shadows. And this is not the first time this idea has been introduced in the book of Hebrews. Listen once again to Hebrews 2, verses 1 through 3. Therefore we must give to more, the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. What are the things which we have heard? What is it that was first spoken by the Lord and then confirmed by those who heard him? It is, my friend, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the same truth which Peter proclaimed to the religious leaders of his day when he said there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. It is the great salvation that had been pictured for centuries in the types of the Mosaical law and the Levitical priesthood. It is the glorious fact that the antitype has now appeared and the heavenly realities are now available to all who will come to Christ in faith. Another passage in Hebrews touches on this same idea. It is Hebrews 6 verses 4 through 6. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. This is yet another passage that has disturbed a lot of people. They become very concerned that they may have committed an unpardonable sin. 
They even become alarmed and think that they may have already committed it and didn't even know that they had done it. But in all of these passages, the writer of Hebrews has the same idea under consideration. If we neglect the great salvation received in Christ Jesus, there is simply no other place where we can find forgiveness of sins. The old law with its types and shadows is only an instructor. It is not a savior. Therefore, to leave the truth of the gospel and go back under the law of Moses is to crucify the Son of God again and to put him to an open shame. And so it is to reject the only way that our sins can ever be forgiven. And so these statements that are made about no more sacrifice for sin, they refer to Jesus because Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. And it was the shadows that were passing away and that were fulfilled in Christ. So to leave Christ and to go back under the shadows of, of the old law would be to abandon the only thing that can save us, and that is the blood of Jesus Christ. Dear friend, is it not evident to you that if you reject the Lord Jesus Christ and his gospel, that there now remains no more sacrifice for sins. In what are you trusting today? Are you looking to the old law of Moses for your salvation? Can't you see that all it can do is picture your salvation? Are you clinging to some human philosophy? Don't you know that God has made the wisdom of this world foolishness? Please don't neglect the great salvation revealed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't crucify Christ again and put him to an open shame. Because if we do these kinds of things, there remains no sacrifice for sin because Jesus is that perfect sacrifice. We pray that your mind will be open to understand the shadows of the Old Testament and the realities, the substance that are in Christ, and that you won't trust in the old shadows, but that you will believe in the realities in Christ. He is our salvation. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, again, we thank you for all of the things that were written before, those things that are contained in the Old Testament and the law, those shadows and types that foreshadowed the coming of Jesus and the gospel and the church and the eternal life that he would secure for us when he died and gave himself on Calvary for our sins. Father, help us to rightly divide your word and help us to uh, learn and remember to keep passages in context so that we won't be confused or misunderstand what you are saying to us. And as we study this book of Hebrews that contains so much about the shadow and the substance, may we be able to separate those old shadows from the realities in Christ. And may we rejoice in the salvation that is ours through the gospel of Jesus Christ our Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We pray that you are enjoying good health and we are just trusting that all is well with you. We, we do pray that if you are not a member of the Lord's church, that you will prayerfully and carefully consider becoming a member of the church. It is that institution that Christ purchased with his own blood. The church is that bride of Christ that is adorned and waiting for his return. So we pray that you will be obedient to the gospel and that you will be a part of the Lord's church here upon the earth, looking forward to his coming and to the eternal abode that he has prepared and promised to those who love him and love his appearing. Until we see you again, may God bless and keep you. They all walked away 
nothing to say They just lost their dearest friend All that he said, now he was dead So this was the way it would end The dreams they had dreamed were not what they seemed Now that he was dead and gone The garden, the jail, the hammer, the nail How could a night be so long? Then came the morning Night turned into day The stone was rolled Before the sun Death had lost And life had won For morning had come The angel, the star The kings from afar The wedding, the water, the wine Now it was done They'd taken her son Wasted before his time She knew it was true She'd watched him die too She'd heard them call him just a man But deep in her heart She knew from the start Somehow the son would live Before the sun Death had lost And life had won For morning had come